how do we know like which of the calls to action from the 20 page truth and reconciliation commission calls to action like are the most important to prioritize today well the key is that we're not going to get it right <laughs> so we need to have our first nations communities and representatives at the decision making table uh, the reason for this is that we may never know what would be a trauma trigger for someone uh, in the First Nations community. So why take that risk and and go and make a decision that we don't know if it's going to actually be beneficial? Like, no, for sure, when we have them involved. So I do feel that this is one of the, the things that is difficult. I talk about the importance of voice and choice. Um, it's difficult to guess. I think that we can read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and we can come to a much stronger understanding of Indigenous voices. I think that the work that was done there is incredible. Um, there's a 535-page uh, report. It is public domain. It has images. I know that this, is, this material is being used in some schools, which is fantastic because that gives you a base understanding. And I've, I've looked through it, and there is some, some very compelling individual stories. And it is those stories, of course, that will help you give, give you an appreciation of that situation. Great. Read the stories. Learn about those things. But when it comes to decision making, how would you apply that today? That's the hard part, right? So you know what happened, but the solutions to them are unclear, right? Every solution has consequences. They have knock-on effects. What that means is that you make a decision to do such and such activity. There may be these other risks that you're not aware of. And so how can you be aware of those risks? That is where having their, like the indigenous voice and choice, and this is like also applies to parent involvement as well. It's like understanding and involving parents in the decision-making process has the same benefits. We don't know what the consequences are. And then that's why having them involved in the discussion makes such a huge difference. I want to also add that when it comes to the voice and choice, knowing the, the right kind of initiatives, I think that, yes, seeing it from the, the lens of trauma is two part. Like one is that that could be one of the ways that you could look at prioritizing because there, there are, I think, um, 20 pages in the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Call to Action. But we, which ones would you prioritize? So you could categorize them. So you could save some time uh, by looking at the trauma lens to, to see like, okay, how do we deal with those ones first? That would be one way of starting the list. And then when it comes to their time, like being respectful of their time, it could be, okay, among these three options, like is there one that you think would be better? And how would we do it in, that, in a way that would be respectful? Uh, that would be another way. So it, it helps because they've already said what they wanted. <laughs> They've already made it clear. And so I like the, the idea of that. And so I like the idea that they've already had their voice said here. They've already kind of made some choices as to what they would prefer. Uh, but I do think that it's not easy to prioritize them. And it's not easy to know if that helps um, people today. And I think that's the key, is that the Indigenous experience is a lived experience. And it is in this lived experience that there, there still is trauma happening today. And one of the things that Antoinette Cooper, um, who I referred to earlier, said that was that healing from trauma is a natural state of our bodies, right? So, for example, if you, if you get an injury, like a cut, for example, you heal naturally. Um, really, the, the question is not whether or not healing will occur. It's like, what is preventing healing from occurring. Maybe there's a scab and it keeps getting picked at, right? And that's preventing healing. So are there things that, that prevent healing? And can we understand what those are that prevent the natural type of healing from happening? I think that that is a really interesting thing to look at uh, from the perspective of, of trauma is to think of it as it is, it is a really tough event. And then over time, there, there is healing that occurs, but there are things that prevent that healing from occurring. There are things that are happening right now that are kind of opening up that wound over and over and over again. 
And if we can understand what those are, if we can have those communicated to our communities, that can make a big difference. And, and sometimes it's not even, it is, it is not things that we think about. Like we, we're not doing it like to try to be cruel on purpose. We just didn't know. And how would you know? Like you would, you would need to be trained on these things. You would need to understand what is a trigger or what is trauma for them.